love. What? Why? How? Have you ever wondered why you obsess over a crush? Why holding hands with your boyfriend or girlfriend feels so great? Why you feel empty after a breakup? The, que- the answers to these questions aren't as simple as because you like them. No. The answer goes much deeper than that. Deep into the neurocognitive functions of the brain and the cocktail of different hormones responsible for our emotions all the way from that initial stage of attraction to marriage. So let's explore the chemistry of chemistry. I was really proud of that name. <laughs> to start, let's try to answer the following question. Why? Why do we feel attraction? In other words, why is finding the one, or using a more animalistic term, a suitable mate important? Why not just mate with anyone? Now, this all relates to the concept of sexual selection, the subset of the Darwinist theory of natural selection. The human population varies enormously. We all have different hair colors, uh, body shapes, metabolisms, and many of these characteristics are heritable, meaning they get passed down from generation to generation. And given that we have finite access to, th- to resources like water, food, and shelter, and we must compete for, for such resources, and when we have overpopulation, we have things like famine and war, it's desirable to produce offspring that, with, the, with characteristics that best able them to survive. Hence the, hence the saying, survival of the fittest. Now, sexual selection comes into play when one, when one gender prefers members of the opposite sex with certain desirable characteristics, hence allowing these characteristics to be passed down to future, gener- to future generations. So, what do we look for, and why? Now, for an example of sexual selection, we can look to giraffes. Female giraffes prefer mates with longer necks, which are more able to find food than those with shorter, with shorter necks. And as a result of this, we see a general population of giraffes with really long necks and <laughs> able to eat eat leaves in the highest boughs of trees, and more able to survive than those with shorter necks. But what about with humans? In 1995, the Swiss biological researcher Klaus Wedekind conducted an experiment to investigate human pheromones, human pheromones and their role in mate preference. In this study, women were asked to smell t-shirts worn by different men, and the results showed that women preferred men whose MHC molecules, molecules that are used to fight disease, differed from theirs. Now, this makes sense. Genes that result in a greater variety of immunities will give offspring a major survival advantage. And in both of these examples, we see a general population is created that is more able to survive. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this is why we humans are, are enslaved by our brains, our senses, our hormones, to generally gravitate towards certain people that we find attractive. It allows us to continue the human race. So, how does this work? How are we programmed to respond in certain ways in response to feeling attraction? How do we even feel this attraction in the first place? Now, the answer to this question lies with hormones. Now, I won't go too in depth here, but hormones are essentially chemical messengers, biological substances that are all regulated in our endocrine system, a collection of glands that produce hormones that have to affect bodily functions ranging from things like reproduction to, to metabolism to growth. And these aren't the only functions of hormones. Every day, we can physically see hormones carrying out their functions. Has anyone here ever felt happy, sad, hungry? Now, these are all, these are all caused by the, by the release of a certain cocktail of different hormones that give us the symptoms entailed with feeling that emotion. Well, I'm American. We have a 36% obesity rate. I consider hunger an emotion. But back to actual emotions, when our heart beats faster, our muscles tense up, when we feel a burst of energy, our, an increased breathing rate, our blood pressure rises, we know that there are increased levels of epinephrine and norepinephrine in our bloodstream, and we know that we feel angry. But what about attraction? Every single thing you feel throughout love and attraction is controlled by hormones. And too often there are a lot of hormones that are rushing around our body, so emotions can get very complicated during a relationship. <laughs> So, let's start walking through all the different stages of a relationship. Maybe you feel that as soon as you see someone, or maybe it comes along significantly after. But the vast majority of relationships start with at least some level of attraction between two people, referred to as lust. Now, there are two different main hormones responsible for sexual attraction, ones that, are, the ones that everyone's heard of before. Testosterone and estrogen, one for men and both for women, and each causing attraction towards, towards the other. 
well, usually I don't discriminate. But now secretion of these hormones um, initiates during puberty, which is why teenagers are, well, you know, teenagers. <laughs> now, in one study conducted in 2010, a group of women at different points in their ovulation cycles wore the same t-shirt for three nights. Male volunteers were then asked to smell a series of t-shirts, some worn, some unworn, and interestingly, after smelling a shirt worn by, by women undergoing ovulation, male saliva samples showed an increase in, tes in testosterone concentrations. So, what does that mean? This means that the same hormones that might cause an increase in female libido during ovulation may also give men the testosterone boost that would encourage him to pursue a woman that he may not have otherwise. Now, this could link back to the nature of attraction, how we are supposed to find mates and continue the human race. Being attracted to one person may inherently increase the likelihood of them being attracted back to you. If only it worked like that all the time. <laughs> now, before I, <laughs> now, before I go any further, I want to emphasize the importance to differentiate between a desire for sex, also known as lust, and the deeper personal attraction, sorry, deep, uh, deeper personal attraction associated with romance and love, things found in healthy long-term relationships. People can enjoy purely physical sexual encounters with, with others that they have no real fondness for other than the, like an appreciation for their appearance, and even that isn't really essential. But the bottom line here is, is that lust says nothing about the, the bond of love in a relationship. And that's okay, because relationships start there, then progress to something, for, something more. But how do we get to that something, something more? How do we get to an actual relationship? Now, a major player in this is flirting. But how does that work? In animals, we see flirting acts as nature's solution to a problem that every creature faces in a world full of potential mates. How to choose the right one. Now, an article published in Psychology Today explained this very, explains this very eloquently, and I quote, our animal and human ancestors needed a means of quickly and safely judging the value of potential mates without going all the way and risking pregnancy with every possible candidate they encountered. Flirt, now, flirting achieved that end offering a relatively risk-free set of signals with which to sample the field, try out sexual wares, and exchange vital information about candidates' reproductive fitness and general health. So, essentially, flirting serves as the human equivalent of an animal's mating dance. When we lean towards a person, when we smile at them, when we make eye contact, we as humans are conveying our feelings, sending a message to other people to tell them that we are interested in them. Now, another major player in flirting is touch. In 2009, a psychologist named Matthew Hertenstein demonstrated that we have an innate ability to decode emotions by a touch alone. Now, in a series of studies, Hertenstein had, volunteer, had volunteers attempt to decode emotions um, to, a list, to a list of blindfolded individuals solely through touch. And participants communicated eight distinct emotions with accuracy rates as high as 78%, significantly higher than the chance value of about 25%. And not only does touching allow you to send emotional messages, but it also triggers oxytocin release, enhancing trust and attachment, essential aspects of a relationship. Touch also lowers stress hormones, which not only make you feel better, but also reduces that initial sense of nervousness or fear that you may encounter when meeting, some, meeting someone attractive. And that same sense of fear is the excuse I give my friends when they ask me why women don't talk to me. <laughs> so let's say it works out. You just started a relationship and you enter what's colloquially termed as the honeymoon phase. That's that initial period of a relationship with high levels of passionate love, characterized by intense feelings of attraction and ecstasy, and as well as an idealization of one's partner. Now, these feelings have physical manifestations too, like heart palpitations and butterflies in the stomach. And it's during this time when two people may share a first kiss, a highly memorable occurrence in any relationship, assuming you're sober. <laughs> Now, scientists have investigated this phenomenon and found that emotionally charged events, whether it be anger or fear are characterized, or joy, are characterized by a spike in, in the hormone nor norepinephrine, which primes nerve cells to remember events by increasing their chemical sensitivity at sites where nerves rewire to form new memory circuits. So basically, it readies our receptors to allow our brains to quickly adjust and lock that memory in place, something that I find incredibly interesting. But, Back to the honeymoon phase, using fMRI scanners, scientists have actually identified brain regions associated with that feeling of love. Individuals who experience passionate love show greater activation in areas, uh, in areas like the caudate nucleus, important in learning and memory, 
as well as the ventral tegmental area, central to emotional processing. Now, both of these brain areas tend to be rich in dopamine, a neurotransmitter associated with uh, reward and motivation. One study also revealed that, the, that recent lovers had higher level, levels of nerve, nerve growth factor, NGF, a protein that aids in the development and functioning of neurons. And the authors then speculated that these enhanced NGF levels might increase a person's feelings of euphoria, a connection. And actually, when measuring these NGF levels 12 to 24 months later, they actually found that the differences between this passionate love group and others had actually faded. So what does this mean? This suggests that romantic love is an arousing yet that stressful ex ex uh, experience, but that these physiological changes are short-lived, perhaps because we become acclimated with our partner over time. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. According to one study at NYU, researchers found that, it, that this phase wears off after about 30 months, but, and I quote, many married couples reported entering a different type of love, something just as deep, if not deeper, than that initial fire. So what happens after the honeymoon phase? What happens when you know your partner and are in love? Now the drug cocaine lowers the threshold of pleasure centers in the brain, meaning we feel really, really good a lot easier. And the same phenomena is seen in the brains of those in love. Essentially, it's not just taking cocaine or being in love that we enjoy, but it's that these things make everything else feel even better. Pain centers in the brain also begin to fire less, so we aren't bothered us by things as much. Essentially, we as humans love love. But what is love? Now the answer to this lies not in the heart, but in the brain. During sexual activity, or even by simply looking at photos of a loved one, our brains experience surges in the hormones dopamine and norepinephrine, triggering arousal and causing a heart rate to rise, as well as motivating us to be with that person more and more. Oxytocin levels also rise, nourishing bonding and attachment. However, we also experience abnormally low levels of serotonin, similar levels to, those, to the brains of those diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, a likely cause of our obsessions during early love. What about marital or long-term love? A study published in 2011 in the Journal of Social Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience investigated the brain activity of individuals experiencing long-term intense romantic love using fMRI scanners. A total of 17 men and women married an average of just over 21 years underwent fMRI scanning while viewing facial images of their partner along with control images of, a, of friends of varying degrees of closeness. Effects specific to their romantic partner were found in areas that were dopamine rich, in the dopamine rich reward systems, consistent with the results from early stage romantic love. However, individuals experiencing long term love had increased activities in regions of the brain associated with maternal attachment, especially regions dense with the hormones vasopressin and oxytocin, which are known to play critical roles in monogamous pair bonding. Overall, these results show that the reward value associated with a partner may be sustained throughout love, but in long-term partners, brain systems implicated in attachment and bonding play greater roles than they would in, in a newer relationship. But what, what happens when these reward systems are unsatisfied? What happens when we experience a breakup? I was crushed. It was a knife to the chest. She ripped my heart out. Now, metaphors like these aren't just a mode of language. Scientifically speaking, we actually feel as though our heart is being ripped out of our chest. Kind of. Essentially, the pain of heartbreak activates the same exact neurological regions as those in physical pain, notably the anterior cingulate cortex. Our brain essentially doesn't distinguish between physical and emotional pain, which is why they hurt all the same. In fact, a, a study published in Psychological Science had participants describe the levels of pain they felt while reliving both a physical and socially painful experience. Afterwards, each participant was then tasked to work on a series of cognitive problems, and the progress was monitored. Not only did participants who relived the emotionally painful experience report a greater level of pain, but they also performed, performed poorly on the following mental tasks. Something about emotions just seems to make that pain more long-lasting and affects our ability to think, which is why we should never deal with such issues alone. And not only this, but a study published in the Journal of Neurophysiology examined the brain activity of an individual suffering from a breakup, with fMRI scans showing large similarities between in the brain activity of individuals, of these individuals, and those recovering 
from drug addictions. The study examined the brains of 15 college-age men and women had, who had recently broken up with their partner, yet still reported feelings of love. And in this experiment, they were asked to look at, brain, look at photos of the loved one, among other photographs, of course, and while fMRI uh, machines examined, examined their brain activity. Now, results revealed that activated areas of the brain unique to the photo of their loved one were those that were dopamine-rich, in the same areas of which activate while under the effects of cocaine. Now, this was consistent with their hypothesis, that romantic rejection is a special form of addiction, explaining why the beloved is, can be so difficult to give up. Our brains literally get hooked on love. So when we go through a breakup, it can look a lot like withdrawal. This could also explain why behaviors relating to romantic rejection can be so difficult to control. Hence, even though we know it's bad for us, we might stalk our exes on, so our exes on social media anyway, just because our brains are seeking that dopamine reward that we associate with our ex like an addict seeking to relapse. Fortunately, however, breakup pain is impermanent. Eventually, the brain will accept that it will, no, it will no longer get the love that it deserves, and the levels of dopamine will normalize, and the stress caused by high, level, high levels of cortisol and norepinephrine will recede, and we get over someone. Now, this phenomena is eloquently explained in the book The Idiot Brain by Dean Burnett, a neuroscientist at Cardiff University. Essentially, during a relationship, our brain adapts to expect the reward associated with our romantic partner. Think about everything the brain associates, the brain invests into sustaining a relationship. All that value placed on one person. If this ceases, all that expected positive sensations removed, the brain is going to be seriously neg negatively affected, hence the pain of a breakup. However, our brain chemistry will eventually revert to normal, even if it is a slow process. And in this case, science and cliches really do match up. Things will get better with time. Now, before I finish off, I would like to emphasize that love is something that transcends science. You can spend hours upon hours analyzing the why behind our emotions, but never truly understand what they are, what they mean. I can tell you from personal experience that I'm just as emotionally incompetent now as when I started preparing for this presentation. And a good love song will always illustrate the bond of love more effectively than any kind of scientific explanation. But because it would probably be an act of war for me to subject you all to my singing voice, I'm going to end this presentation with a poem that I feel truly depicts the varying nature of the journey to love. And I promise I didn't find it on Pinterest. Hurt and pain, there's much to gain. Peace and love, it's all the same. Confusion and doubt, we're not without. We weep, we smile, we laugh, we cry, only to be hurt by one last trial. Life is a lesson, so learn it well. Maybe one day you can tell its tale. Thank you.